President Zhang Shang, my Asia Global Institute brothers in arms, Mike Spence, Andrew Shang, Hei Wei Tang, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very big warm welcome to all of you. It is really heartwarming to see that after the COVID uh, lockdowns and so on, the first time we're having a meeting in person, we're seeing such a tremendous attendance. Uh, a very special thanks to all of you that have come from overseas, and of course, our Asia Global Fellows. And we're having a reunion of the Asia Global Fellows at this occasion. And I'd like to welcome all of you uh, back to Hong Kong. As you can all see, Hong Kong is not only back in business, but I think we are re-emerging resilient. Since the first Asia Global Dialogue in 2012, the world has really changed beyond recognition. Hong Kong too has gone through a transformation. We have redefined and are ready to reclaim our position as a global financial center, and just as importantly, to serve as the international hub for one of the most vibrant economic regions in China and in the world, and that's of course the Greater Bay Area. In 2012, for those of you who actually came to the first Asia Global Dialogue, uh, the global economy was really rebalancing to the East. And that was our theme at the time. That rebalancing is still underway. Asia's share of global GDP is now around 36% and forecast to be nearly 50% by 2050. This, of course, will overtake OECD's uh, countries, which will be expected to be around 43% by 2050, the middle of the century. May I add that Hong Kong is well-placed both to drive and benefit from this rebalancing. Aside from rebalancing, I believe that something even more fundamental is going on. It is a bigger, really a bigger shift is happening in the world, and really a new paradigm is emerging. How the world gets to grips with this new paradigm will, in my view, determine how effectively we will tackle the global challenges from poverty to climate and so on, and whether we can deliver a better future for our children and grandchildren. In that spirit, I would like to throw out to you this morning some very preliminary thoughts on really, uh, hopefully would set the scene for today's deliberations. The theme, of course, is a new global growth paradigm in a multimodal world. I would qualify those thoughts again to say that, you know, this is really uh, very preliminary thoughts. And I'm going outside my comfort zone you guys have always heard me talk about business and economics and multilateralism. I'm going to actually go outside my comfort zone and really talk about, I think, a bigger change that we see is happening in this world. Now, if you look at uh, the world 75 years ago, you go back to the time just after the Second World War, okay, there was really one dominant economy and one dominant power, the United States, of course which accounted for about 50% of the world's GDP at that time. Uh, re and, and it was what I call, what everybody calls a unimodal world. We had for a period of about 50 to 60 years, what many have called Pax Americana. Uh, the United States created a very beneficial multilateral system that benefited all. Obviously it benefited the United States, it benefited China, Hong Kong, had a tremendous run because of that. And we ourselves and our family in uh, Li and Fong, uh, our whole company was built on global supply chains at that, on, on that period. But if you really take a look at uh, um, the situation today, I think things actually in the last, I would have to say 10, 15 years have not been going as well the multilateral systems are frailing a little bit at the edges. You know, I'm, I'm a lifelong multilateralist. You know, I've been uh, really working very actively in WTO for my whole life. And I have to admit, 
that the last real success was the Bali Declaration in 19, uh, 2013, uh, which is really uh, the world came together to see how we can um, basically improve trade facilitation, which is to reduce costs in the way trade is done. And even then, I don't think we have seen much improvement in the whole system uh, from, from that Bali uh, um, uh, agreement. And that's 2013. And since then, 10 years ago, I must I have to admit that really not much has really come out of the multilateral system. So where are we? I think we're really at crossroads to really have to think about um, really what's really happening in the world. And in Asia, I think if you look at this whole period, a key outcome was the rise of two economies that have come to be viewed as potential challenges to the US economic dominance. First, Japan in the 1980s, and now China. Perhaps that's because the US share of the global economy today is actually down to around 25%. And in fact, any forecast I can lay my hands on will look at the US taking up uh, around 15, 16% of the global economy by the middle of the century, 2050. So China's share, now about 18%, is expected to hold steady at that level. And of course, a very big growth will be expected from the Indian economy, from a lower base, it will be coming up. So every forecast I can hold, put my hands on for the world in 2050 is gonna be three economies, China, United States, India. And then there's a gap before um, the other people coming up. So this is a reality that we have to really recognize. From the unimodal world that we see, we're absolutely emerging into a multimodal world. And the question is, how do we actually uh, think about the situation? How do we handle the situation? Uh, one of the things that um, I... I, I um, have, have really been become very apparent to me is while the world order was built on a unimodal world and continues to be run that way, the external environment has shifted to a multimodal world. And you're trying to, in a sense, do a very successful unimodal solution to a situation that has become multimodal. There's a disconnect really between the way our global systems are versus the global order versus what is the reality out in the field. And I think the earlier we recognize that reality and start thinking about a shift in the paradigm and to see how we can embrace this new world, I think the better off we are. So really, this is, this is the thing that I really like to bring to your attention. Now, if you also think back, the unimodal system that shaped the post-World uh, World War II order was actually or really originally anchored what I would consider in economics, in trade and investment. Liberalization of trade and investment, and it really, the world took off. I was involved in a lot of that, you know, and the WTO really took the lead in, in the early days. And I think it really produced widespread benefits Developing economies were able to actually come up uh, really in, in the world because they had bootstrapped themselves in, in development in this world that was anchored in economic development, in economics. Now, however, I think if you open a newspaper every day, what do you see? I think we have to admit that the world today is really anchored in politics and no longer in economics. Uh, it is inevitable that if you think about a unimodal paradigm, there's always, shall we say, somebody at the top. And whether we like it or not, by definition, there's always going to be a second economy coming up on you. And if you're constantly looking over your shoulders on who's going to challenge you and remove you from that one top spot, then you have a situation in which you really are now 
really uh, caught. So what we really now are seeing is a world that's anchored in politics. And in a, in a, in a simple way, my thought would be, how do we now re-anchor the whole global system and the way we think about it away from politics back to economics? And I think that is the way that we are able to now think about solving some of the really tough problems of the world. Unless we do that, I think all the things that we care about, poverty, climate change, inequality, etc., I think will be very, very hard to address. So to me, we should really now recognize the realities of what's happening and then start thinking about how do we go about re-anchoring the world back to where we were, which is on economics. So, you know, if, if we look at my area, just to give you one example, okay, supply chains. You know, I've been working on this area, you know, my whole life. And this is a prime example. Global economic, financial, and trade is really totally fragmented and has intensified in recent years amid really rising geopolitical tensions and really protectionist sentiments. Efficient supply chains have been disrupted and dismantled you know, on the grounds of protecting national interest and security. This really, unfortunately, has resulted in higher costs and especially for the poorer countries and even in the advanced economy and inflation. And in fact, it's not doing the world a lot of good. Now, so really what we really need to do is to really conceptualize the world. I, I'm running out of my time, but now I'm just trying to, this thing is flashing at me, okay. Yeah, okay. If we think about where we are, I think we're really making a transition from a unimodal world to a multimodal world. It's very simple. And almost by necessity, we have to go through a bimodal phase before we can get to a multimodal world. We are now in that bimodal phase. It is what I would call dangerous no man's land. In that bimodal phase, uh, all the things you read about Thucydides' principle, you know, downward spiral, zero-sum game, etc., could really come into play. And what we really need to think about is two things. One is, how do we make the transition through this dangerous no man's land, the bimodal phase, and go to what I call terra firma in the multimodal phase, where you have some chance of really global stability? And how do you make the transition through that? And then, in fact, how do you navigate through this bimodal phase, you know, is really crucial. And the thing that I really want to say about the bimodal phase is very simple. Without doubt, the most important bilateral relationship in the world is U.S.-China bilateral relationship. But I have to make the point that that bilateral relationship not only affects U.S. and China, it affects everybody else in the world. There is a, a large number of stakeholders in that relationship. So one thing that we really need to start thinking about is how to broaden that and for other people to actually not have the primary say, but have some say in how we make that transition. And the second thing is I talk about terra firma. What is this terra firma? What does it look like? You know, how do we construct that so that it is stable? You know, it will be a, 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 you know, a number of economies, you know, recognizing the economic realities of where the world will be by the middle of the century. But the governance of that terra firma is going to be key. So, frankly, I want to say, and I'll conclude, I have no solutions. I'm just really sharing with you my my, 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 the problems that I see in my mind and really like to just throw it out to you to think about this and to challenge you in occasions like this to think this through and come up with solutions. What are the attributes of this terra firma that I talk about? Is it really terra firma? Some people may believe that's the that's worst system 
than even bilateral. I, I, have, to, I have to acknowledge that, right? And if it is, how do we actually get the elements to construct it? And then, of course, there's a lot of thought. Can we reconstruct the existing Bretton Woods multilateral institutions to f be fit for purpose for this new, you know, multimodal world? Or we have to think about rebuilding uh, from scratch. So I have a long uh, um, uh, paper that I'm just beginning to share with you, but these are really um, work in progress. These are just very initial thoughts. And I've used up my time, and actually, I've used up my voice. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Can I ask for you to remain on the stage so we can take a group photo, please? Yeah, thank you. And um, may I also, uh, let's capture this moment. So may I also invite all of our speakers and board members to join us on the stage as well. And while we're waiting for our speakers and board members to come up, I just want to reflect on a couple of points that Dr. Fung mentioned. You know, the Asia's rise really will be the most transformative and profound event of our lifetime. And I think this point about collaborating to solve these global challenges really resonates with all of us, including Professor Zhang's comment earlier about really uh, AGD's ability to bridge these worlds beyond Hong Kong University. So thank you, all our guests. Please take your uh, positions on the stage. <laughs> 